Thank you for joining us again on our walking tour of Taylor's Falls. This is segment three of the tour, and it starts on Bench Street, just north of 2nd Street on the northern corner. Looking across Bench Street to the west, you'll notice the historically designated 1866 Samuel Hamilton home at 431 Bench Street. It's also a deceiving structure. Built for noted Swedish immigrant Samuel Hamilton, it was originally constructed in the Greek Revival style, but made of squared off logs, covered in clabbered siding as Hamilton tried to Americanize himself, even going so far as to change his last name from Swedberg to further shed his Swedish roots. Hamilton was noteworthy for several avocations, including being a prominent photographer, a grocer, and later a man of the law as a local sheriff. He only lived in Taylor's Falls for about 11 years, but also became known for his tireless work in the Minnesota State Immigration Agency, assisting other Swedes in their move to the region. Looking across the street beside the Hamilton to the north at 443 Bench Street is the circa 1854 C.V. Couvillian home. Built for Ambrose C.V. from Maine, he was Taylor's Falls' first blacksmith. The home began as a small Greek revival, but was moved on its lot twice and also extensively remodeled into an Italianate in 1873 by French-Canadian Joseph Couvillian. Beside the C.V. Couvillian at 455 Bench Street is the Canada Truesdale House. That home was constructed in 1873 for David A. Canada. He was another New Englander, also known as a Civil War veteran, a newspaper publisher, and a mineralogist. The home was originally a Greek revival, like the C.V. beside it, but in 1898, it was turned and remodeled into a two-story, more traditional four-square style, with extensive use of local stone on the front porch. That remodeling was undertaken by a former dentist and later Interstate State Park manager and mayor by the name of C.M. Truesdale. Beside that is a small 1903 dental office for Dr. Truesdale, replacing the 1880 George Seymour building in roughly the same spot, but later moved to the rear of the property and removed altogether. Beside the old dental office at 473 Bench Street is the famous Taylor's Falls Public Library. Originally built in the mid-1850s, probably in 1857, but possibly as early as 1854, the tiny building started life as a home and a tailoring shop for Mr. J.J. Spengler. It was later remodeled in 1888 in the current Victorian East Lake style and is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. Noted as one of the last surviving independent libraries in the state, let alone the Midwest. The Taylor's Falls Library Association was established in 1871, with the current library building being used as such since 1888. It's so when it was sold to the association and remodeled extensively to a grand affair and public opening on November 16, 1888. But it wasn't until 1919 the association disbanded and the little building officially became known as the Taylor's Falls Public Library. The library building is being repainted this week in brilliant colors resembling Joseph's coat. Chisago County News, Taylor's Falls, November 1st, 1888. The little building continues to be used as a library with limited hours, and it's been much celebrated since, with a special attention being paid in recent decades to keeping its historic charm and Victorian painted lady style. Also note that this library and its librarian inspired some of the plot of the 1975 New York Times best-selling mystery novel called The Windchill Factor by Thomas Gifford, who died in 2000. The library and 11 other prominent homes and buildings from that tour were part of a Taylor's Falls Historical Society Windchill Factor tour in the fall of 1989, with Mr. Gifford himself in town for the two-day event. Now, Gifford called the town Cooper's Falls in the novel, but many local buildings and personalities were hidden there in its pages. He ended up selling nearly 800,000 copies of the book, and the book not only gave Gifford literary credit, it also gave the city and the state of Minnesota a literary boost, with a little library as some of that inspiration. To the north of the library is the notable Riley Sisters House, which began life as a smallish, single-story Greek revival, but was expanded dramatically by the Riley Sisters, Mary and Maddie, in 1892 into the dramatic Queen Anne style of today. However, that home began life without the notable turret and extensive front porch of today, as they were added almost a century later. The Riley sisters were truly ahead of their time and made their fortunes in real estate, and also by selling handmade ladies' gloves. As we continue our stroll north, we see the old telephone company building of 1959, beside the grand Riley sisters' home. Expanded in the 1970s by the Continental Telephone Company, 
It's where a dramatic change occurred in the city one Sunday in April of 1960 as full dial service was established, allowing users to dial without operator assistance. No longer would they hear, what number please? Instead, people could dial directly. You'll notice a home at 497 Bent Street, known as the Peter Nordine Home. While many of the historic structures of the city today have either changed, expanded, or moved and altered over the decades since, the 1912 four-square Nordine home is an exception, looking pretty much like it did when it was built about a century ago for the Peter Nordine family. Nordine hailed from Sweden, was a logger, and later a construction worker and longtime technician on the hydroelectric dam on the river, finally succumbing to an injury in 1922. Nordine and his wife Hulda had two children, one of whom, Miss Shirley, was a postal clerk who stayed in the grand home through her later years and was noted for her friendliness, sitting on her front porch and greeting all who passed by. At one time, there was an early hotel and boarding house about where the Nordine home now stands. Built in 1853 and remaining until 1887, the Cascade House also had a stable on the north end of the Nordine, but that too is long gone. Looking to your right, on the east side of Bench Street is St. Joseph's Catholic Church, which looks nothing like the tiny original 1873 structure. Originally built way up above the city near Center and Walnut Streets, it was relocated at this spot in 1952 with a new structure built around it five years later, and significant expansions in the 1980s and 90s to its current look. Now take note of that rich, blonde Casota stone we referenced earlier on Bench Street. That stone was quarried in southern Minnesota, near Mankato, and transported upstream at great expense. It was that same type of blonde stone that graced the lost Hauser Ellison building. Well, as we continue our stroll north, take note of several buildings across Bench Street to the west, including the historic home at 519 Bench Street, the so-called 1873 Tang Building. It began life as a stable and a warehouse for Frederick Tang Sr., he was a carpenter of German descent and later served in the 7th Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment during the Civil War. The Tang Building is one in a long line of historic homes and buildings up the road to the north, including the adjacent 1895 barn and the 1868 Bullard Owens home beside it at 537 Bench Street. That home was later owned by Colonel John P. Owens, a Civil War veteran and pioneer newspaper editor whose contributions to journalism in Minnesota are notable still. Let's head for that rotating root beer mug as our tour winds down. On our way to the famous rotating frost stop root beer mug, we've passed the 1975 Riverfront Apartment Building and the 1996 Post Office and noted several historic homes, many of which are designated as historically significant. But everyone wants to know about that giant frost stop root beer mug. Well, the drive-in began in 1956, originally known as Allen's Drive-In. However, the giant mug didn't arrive until 1963 coming from a former Frost Stop drive-in near Hastings, Minnesota. The mug is one of the most popular landmarks of the area and continues to fascinate visitors and customers still. So go ahead and take your picture below it. The old drive-in? It's known for its car hops and throwbacks of the 50s style and remains a popular destination for the whole region. It's also just another reminder of our fascination for food and nostalgia here in Taylor's Falls. Well, there are several notable structures ahead and across Bench Street worth noting, including the charming little yellow ochre home at 573 Bench Street. That Greek Revival home was formerly known as the Porter Wall House. It's locally historically designated as well. Having had dozens of occupants and owners over the years, the Porter Wall was also known as the home of the old Dallas Visitor newspaper until not so long ago. It also has a cool, complimentary little garage barn to the north beside it. As you walk along approaching the Greek Revival James Payne House at 607 Bench Street, you might enjoy the story of the original owner before he built the home. He was an Englishman who came to town as a young man and operated the old Cascade House Hotel. He was also involved in lumber and was a barkeep and a billiard hall operator to boot. He also has an interesting story which was mentioned in an 1881 book called The History of Washington County and the St. Croix Valley, a volume of material compiled by several authors. They write of Payne's taking of his wife, Mahala. In the natural course of events, she was wooed and won and married by one James Payne without the knowledge of the self-appointed guardians, her sister and brother-in-law. As soon as they ascertained the fact, they enticed the girl to their home and locked her up with the determination to send her away and annul the marriage. A band of indignant citizens gathered to the aid of Payne for the rescue of the girl, delivering her to her rightful husband. Assaulting the house, they broke down the door, utterly regardless of a pistol discharged within by the Bush family. 
As the door went down, under the pressure of the heavy plank and force from without, Bush was caught under it as though it were a deadfall, gun in hand. James Smith wrestled the gun from his grasp and attempted to break it by striking it on the rock. The gun was discharged, the charge passing under his arm and grazing his side. No serious damage was done, however, and James Payne obtained his wife. Well, James Payne's old broadside home is also noted for having the entrance moved from the side facing you, where the street was first planned, to the current location facing east. It's also the final stop on our tour. But as these last few homes and their occupants of the past have noted, Taylor's Falls history is laced with interesting and exciting stories, as well as heroic military men and women of all eras, as evidenced by the extensive monuments further up the bluff ahead at the Cabocong Cemetery, which was opened in 1855. A trip through the Cabocong is also a trip back through the ages, and the heritage of those who made Taylor's Falls what it is today, transforming it from a wilderness camp on the river to the thriving electric city it is today. Many of the previously mentioned men and women remain prominent still in the memorials and headstones of the historically designated cemetery, including fallen soldiers and veterans from nearly every U.S. conflict. We also invite you to explore Taylor's Falls on your own, possibly by continuing on ahead and around Pine Street to the right, east to River Street, where you'll pass even more sites of the past, including the former Mill Pond site, where cold weather made ice skating a community-wide event for a century. It was so busy, in fact, they formed a group called the Breakneck Committee, meant to keep order on the ice. The pond was filled in back in the early 1950s, but you'll also have clear views of the inviting river and the valley below, also St. Croix Falls, Wisconsin, and of course that massive, imposing hydroelectric dam that sacrificed the old falls, but gave the region the power to grow and blossom into what it is today. We thank you for your time and your interest, and invite you to the numerous businesses and shops of Taylor's Falls, a city that not only respects the past, but builds on that history in grand fashion. This tour was made possible through a Minnesota Historical Cultural Heritage Grant from the Minnesota Historical Society, the City of Taylor's Falls, and the Taylor's Falls Heritage Preservation Commission. But making it happen involved many notable historians and community members, not the least of whom include Jack Lillianberg, William Scott, and Clarence Nelson. They've offered timeless hours of diligent research and resources to establishing and capturing the flavors, the times, the photos, illustrations, and the stories of the people who built this city today. Without their help, and dozens of others who care about the past locally, it would not have come to fruition. A sincere thanks to all who helped keep history and all its lessons and all its color alive.